the Order, order. The Science, Innovation and Technology Committee is in session and we continue our inquiry into astronomy uh, this morning. Uh, and we're pleased to have four international uh, perspectives uh, to inform our inquiry. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our first uh, pair of witnesses, uh, and they are Dr. Jessica Dempsey, uh, who is director at Astron, which is the Netherlands uh, Institute for Radio Astronomy. Uh, and Dr. Jem Dempsey has previously been deputy director of the East Asian Observatory uh, in Hawaii. Uh, joining uh, her virtually uh, is Professor Dr. Michael Kramer, uh, who has been director and scientific member of the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy since 2009, uh, as well as being professor uh, for astrophysics at the University of Manchester. Uh, he is, uh, was president of the German Astronomical Society and chair of the Council of German Observatories uh, and was awarded the Herschel Medal of the UK uh, Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, uh, for coming. We're interested in uh, your your perspective uh, on how different countries compare with the state of astronomy and its funding uh, in the UK. Uh, so I wonder, Dr. Dempsey, whether, given your experience um, of different countries, uh, you might be able to give us a bit of a, uh, a flavour of how things are, are done in the UK and compared to, to the Netherlands and other countries with which you're familiar. Um, happy to do so. Um, not unique, but I certainly have the, I actually worked for the STFC in the UK, of course, being one of the members of um, the original for, uh, foundation that built the James Cook Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. Uh, and so I had a bit of experience with that to compare and contrast with both the Australian systems, but over 10 years in the United States uh, astronomy landscape. Uh, and now uh, two years of a very intense um, experience now here in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, so I think there's two points I would make of note that I find quite what might be pertinent to you. Uh, one is, of course, the United States system, I think, is um, largely uh, coordinated on one very important thing. They do coordinate their priority set over their decadal plan. And so having that decadal plan uh, sort of being the, the the astronomy Bible for the future uh, in uh, in United States astronomy uh, is a very important uh, part of their system. Uh, however, converse to that, it's a very competitive system. Uh, it is survival of the fittest uh, in terms of the funding schemes. And, and that, I think, is something which right now is starting to show cracks because the size and scale, particularly of the ground-based uh, projects that the United States wants to do, uh, and traditionally has done uh, nearly independently of collaborations with other in international um, other countries, uh, has meant that things like now their, their need to build a 30-metre optical telescope, the fact that there were two competing telescopes, uh, and that there is not at the moment enough funding for both of those. Uh, so that's actually at a bottleneck right now, and I think it's in exhibiting a sign that that competitive uh, approach, which has been so successful till now, is now hitting um, funding uh, problems because the scale of these funds are even now surpassing the, the very large US funding systems available. Thank you. That's, um, that's an interesting insight into it. Who resolves the, the, the competition between uh, alternatives there? Who makes the decision in that system? The, the primary funding agency, the, the National Science Foundation, uh, has been the one, of course, who's tried to step in uh, to provide the bridging funds. Otherwise, these funds are a, a consortium uh, of competing university and private interests. Uh, so at the moment, it's at the National Science Foundation to try and resolve. And right now, they've actually said, we can only afford one. Uh, so this really is now going uh, to a, quite a crisis point uh, in that system. And uh, and so I see I see a sort of shift uh, going on there. Whereas I think the comparison I would make uh, right now is the Netherlands, which you know is one of the the smaller countries uh, that I've worked for and within, and yet it's a powerhouse uh, across the scientific landscape. It punches far above its weight compared to uh, its population and its funding. And it's, I think, in part because there's a very organized system of collaboration across the astronomy groups and institutes within the Netherlands. Uh, and that allows them to coordinate their interests. Uh, and in fact, they even sit down and decide 
who's going to go for the next funding round and, and they share it out quite equally. And that tells the funding agencies astronomy's already got themselves sorted out uh, and so they sort of already have this sort of internal review system that enables Dutch astronomy uh, to be very successful uh, in comparison to other STEM fields. It's almost sort of seen as the uh, it, it, it greedy uh, sometimes on the, on the landscape, just simply because they are very organised and and very successful as a result. That's very interesting, and, and um, just to to underline what you said, that is, as it were, sort of self coordinated. The uh, the different institutions agree amongst themselves and then approach the funding agencies. Um, in the in the United States example that um, that you gave, um, is money wasted through that competition, or is it just sort of, as it were, disappointment of people preparing bids and one is chosen, the other is disappointed, or is is there, as it were, sort of money that might be available to science that is lost through that competitive process? I, mean, I think that's a very good question. I do think it is, in some cases, a wasteful process. Uh, we have seen uh, non-successful projects who've gotten to quite advanced stages of development uh, before being uh, passed over. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily exclusive to the United States system, uh, but it certainly does encourage um, projects to have a lot of investment to go towards them. And the risk right now is, you know, these two um, large optical telescopes are very mature. Uh, in terms of the investments that have gone into them. Uh, so if one at this point should uh, not go ahead, uh, it's it's hundreds of millions I see. Um, of dollars that will be lost. Interesting. Uh, and then finally, just on the, the point you made, which is um, uh, a very interesting one, that, that within STEM in the Netherlands, astronomy is seen to, as it were, to do very well. The evidence we've taken mm-hmm. from witnesses principally in the UK has been that within the UK, it's the opposite, that within STEM astronomy seems not to be participating uh, mm-hmm. to the degree that it, it might in the expansion uh, of, of funding. Is, is that something mm-hmm. that you've been aware of, looking, as it were, from the outside uh, over to the UK? Well, actually, to be honest, I, I was one of the uh, very close, uh, unfortunate participants in some of those decisions, of course, one of them being when, uh, when the UK stepped out of, of the collaboration for both the UKIRT uh, infrared telescope in Hawaii, uh, and then and JCMT itself. Uh, so I am very much aware that there have been some difficult choices that were having to be made uh, across the UK landscape in changing funding systems. Um, I think that that definitely is um, interesting here for me in, to see here in the Netherlands that, that a more uh, coordinated approach uh, perhaps avoids some of that w- waste um, you might be able to look on the other side and say, are they bold enough? Um, but I think it's a conservative approach, which up until now has worked very well. Um, and, and certainly I would say I would have more similar levels of, of understanding. The Australian system would be a close comparison in the UK, where astronomy under uh, traditionally has underperformed on the funding landscape compared to other areas uh, of STEM. But arguably with the square kilometre array, um, that would be a, a change uh, in that uh, that is just becoming recently. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's very interesting, very clear. Perhaps I could just turn to Professor uh, Kramer before uh, asking my colleagues. So um, a similar question, obviously from your point of view uh, in the Max Planck Institute and in, in the German system, but you hold a chair at the University of Manchester, so you're, you're clearly aware of certainly the, uh, the German and the UK systems, and I'm sure others as well. Could you give us your perspective on how things uh, are organized, perhaps starting with Germany? Sure. The astronomy research in Germany is quite diverse in its structure. I mean, the largest number of institutions are at the universities. There are about 40 or so. Um, but we also have about eight Max Planck institutes, which get the funding straight from the Max Planck Society, whereas the universities apply for Research Council funding. And then we have also some Helmholtz and Leibniz Associations institutes. But uh, the funding couldn't be more diverse because in Max Planck, uh, I have guaranteed funding until I retire, which is one of the reasons, obviously, why I moved my main position to Germany. Uh, whereas the universities, they do have to apply for research council funding. Um, but because of the diversity, we also gather about every 10 years and try to come up with a common strategy. We just had a meeting earlier this week uh, in, in Potsdam where we came together to say, to identify what are our main focus points and interests for the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, 
we uh, the diversity had a problem in a sense or caused a problem that we didn't have a common national voice, which is uh, at some disadvantage if you talk about big international projects uh, like the SKA or so on. So we didn't have that national voice of Germany speaking for for the country as a whole. And so we didn't have a national center, but we just recently got funding via restructuring of industry and uh, economy in, in Saxony, for instance. Uh, where we obtained 1.3 billion euros of funding to create a national center with the aim to work closely with industry and use astronomy as a technology hub for uh, new innovations and so on. So that has been quite successful in making the case because there are very good examples where astronomy can point towards successes in that area. Um, and yeah, in the UK it's quite different because uh, you, you apply for SDFC funding, you apply for smaller grants and um, it's more homogeneous, so um, it has advantages and, 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 and disadvantages in both systems. But on the Max Planck side, of course, I do enjoy my my long term funding perspective, so I can do high risk, high gain projects without having the, the risk of, of being shut down at some point. Thank you. That's um, uh, again, it's very very striking. B both of you have mentioned uh, ten year horizons, and in, in your case, um, uh, potentially um, lifetime. Uh, funding for your uh, your your tenure, but t ten years is common to to both of you. Uh, obviously, there are things like the Square Kilometre Array, which in effect is funded for ten years in the UK. If you if you bid for it, you make that commitment. But is that is that um, Professor Kramer exceptional? Would you say that from your experience that ten year perspective in the Netherlands and, and Germany is not not practiced in the UK? Um, I, I think 10 years is about the right time scale. There are some really big projects which take that a long time. There are some projects which can be uh, done faster and you need some flexibility on the way. So I don't think you should spend all the money on, on very long-term projects because you want to move around, you want to react to, to new innovations and new uh, discoveries that become important. But I think 10 years is a good point to just look back what has happened to the plans of the last 10 years in order to look forward to the, to the next 10 year plans. And uh, I, I think it also helps to bring the community together to, to focus, to, to agree on what, what is interesting. And I think that uh, in, in the Netherlands, it's maybe easier than in big countries because the community knows each other very well, but Jessica can confirm. Whereas if you have uh, a lot of different institutions like in Germany, like in US, uh, that process brings together these people and, and they make them talk to each other and coordinate and collaborate. And I think that's one important aspect of this. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, I'm now going to turn to my colleagues who've got some questions, starting with uh, Carol Monaghan and then Catherine Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's interesting you're talking about collaboration um, because I'm interested in what the networks are like within your countries. How are the institutions working with, for example, academia, with government, with industry? Is there kind of some sort of um, common voice across all of these different groups, or is everybody working independently? So maybe, um, Dr Dempsey, if you could start. Uh, happy to. Uh, I do think that um, there is a level, of course, of independence in the academic research groups. Uh, and, and that's really, I think, important because you need to be able to have that diversity and ability to engage across you know, a host of different scientific topics uh, and make sure that diversity is also in the people themselves uh, and those opportunities. Uh, I think that institutes such as Astron, uh, you know, which is it's just directly funded through um, the science ministry and the major national funding agency of the Netherlands. Um, they're critical. Um, they're critical structures because we can be both an academic research uh, uh, institute ourselves, but we're also research and development. Uh, and we are in charge of the major infrastructures and, uh, and the observatories, including the Square Kilometre Array and the LOFAR Array based in the Netherlands. That allows us to be a little bit more long-term looking uh, than perhaps a university research uh, infrastructure uh, systems are, uh, and it allows us to be that sort of one-stop place where we can speak 
and represent uh, a broader amount of the the academic community when we're engaging with large collaborations such as an international governmental organization like the Square Kilometer Array or a, a, you know a European research infrastructures which of course we we're, we're actually uh, involved in too. So I think that they uh, having that breadth of different type of uh, groups uh, and making sure that the engagement between them uh, is robust. And so it's very important to me to make sure we have authentic uh, collaborations with our uh, astronomy groups uh, at the universities uh, with shared appointments, for example, uh, so that we maintain uh, that connectivity to the groups, which essentially in some part we're service we're servicing and providing uh, the access to these large infrastructures. And what about um, industry? I mean, you haven't mentioned them. Is it, how do they fit into this? We have very strong industry ties. Over sixty different uh, industries and companies around the Netherlands. Where, um, for example, we will be doing prototyping of design. We build everything from the ground up for uh, radio astronomy, uh, and we will hand out those to fab- uh, fabricate manufacture. Uh, we're also an open source development system, so we're not really interested in the commercial aspects of it, but there's, of course, a lot of knock-on uh, return, uh, societal return in radio astronomy uh, in the developments we're doing across a range of communications uh, systems, for example. Uh, so it's a really strong network. Uh, and on the other hand, for example, in the construction of something like the Square Kilometre Array, uh, we are the agency that therefore interacts with the industries in the Netherlands that are getting the contracts to build portions of that. Uh, so it's a it's a two way street. Thank you. And maybe I could ask the same question to uh, Professor Kramer. Yeah. So the collaboration is very important. I mean, we have this Council of German Observatories, and we meet about twice a year to coordinate and to foster collaboration. And one important thing in particular for universities are these collaborative research centers that are given out by the German Research Council, which is a combination of different universities, sometimes there are sometimes a cluster of universities. And that brings really together the diversity because it's not only including universities, but also non-university research centers. So I think the, the, the biggest result always usually come out of these collaborations to bring in the different opinions, different ideas. And in terms of industry, uh, it's easy, I think, for the non-university institutions uh, to work with industry because of the long-term perspective that we have. I mean, for instance, we're just building uh, the first SKA dishes in, in, in South Africa with a, a German company. Um, and uh, this new center in Saxony, the, one of the main uh, purposes is indeed to, to foster this very di- direct link with, you know, with industry uh, Saxon industry, but also German white. So I think uh, the in astronomy does work as a, as a innovation um, creator, and then we basically collaborate with industry to 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 commercialize it and, and to make it available to the public. It doesn't always work, um, but uh, without industry. Uh, um, it wouldn't work. I mean, if you if you think about uh, short industries and mines, they're producing the Ceredua glass, which is now used for lithography of high semiconductor production. And without that glass, which was created to build optical telescopes, uh, it wouldn't work. So um, this this link to industry is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, you've both talked about the, the positive aspects of it. Are there anything anything that is not done well that could be improved? Yeah. <laughs> it's just now the, 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 the politicians in Germany trying to change the law that we can only employ uh, postdoctoral researchers for a maximum amount of four years before we have to give them a permanent position. There are not enough permanent positions in the system in Germany and what it means is actually that we will not be able to hire a lot of German postdocs in the future. We have to rely on foreign postdocs coming in and out of the country. And I think that's a big, big mistake. And I don't know how much damage the German system will do there. Uh, uh, and, and and so this, uh, if, if I can advise you, in the UK don't limit the time contracts. And, uh, I mean, that's really interesting because some of the evidence we've had in this and other inquiries is about the, the short term nature of postdoc contracts and how it doesn't, it's, it's not a positive situation for those researchers. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Kramer. Dr. Dempsey, anything to add to that? I think that was actually a really astute point from Michael. We have limitations ourselves. There's very strict collective labour agreements in the Netherlands, uh, which means that you know these temporary style of contracts uh, are very short term, and so therefore we have to make them permanent rather quickly. Um, and uh, and having the you know it is a wasteful system in the academic sense regarding PhDs to postdocs, um, and uh, and so those two things I think are definitely um, uh, and you know, we could do better. Uh, absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, I think that having institutes where you can have more permanent levels of career opportunity gives um, options for people who might not have been going directly into the postdoctoral system and then directly into the academic system. Uh, so having some diversity of career opportunity uh, is something which we I'm really actively trying to look at how we can do that so we're less wasteful with our talent. Thank you. I want to change direction slightly, or quite majorly now. Um, we've had a lot of evidence that low Earth um, orbiting satellites are causing a lot of light pollution and um, bringing their own challenges to this area. Um, are, what progress, first of all, how much of an issue is this, and also how much progress has been made on an international level to tackle this um, perhaps Dr. Kramer could start with you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's indeed a hugely important uh, topic. I think it wouldn't be overstated if we, I say there is a fear that the generation of children today may be the last one which can see the sky as it is today, uh, because uh, there is uh, the real threat that uh, 100,000 or more satellites will really block our view on the night sky and uh, give you the possibility to to understand how small of a planet in the universe we are. <laughs> it's very much important for, for radio astronomy because these satellites communicate, they communicate at radio frequencies. It's a huge problem. The protected band uh, for radio frequencies in, in astronomy is very small. Uh, and even worse, uh, of course, the um, there is no international regulations in uh, if once we have launched a satellite. So what is urgently needed is indeed uh, some international framework that limits the use of these uh, satellites in space. At the moment, every country can launch their own satellite constellation and it doesn't have to account internationally. Um, and that needs to be changing. So I think there it would be very important that we come very quickly uh, to some international agreement that regulates how space is used in that respect. And if I can and add, it would be sorry, really Chris important that Ofcom would uh, be joining other voices in, in that regard. That, because I was going to ask that, how much progress has been made on an international level, so Ofcom has not been part of those discussions. Uh, there have been part of a discussion about simply a care. It, it's always better to talk more. There is a what we call a radio conference from inter organized by the United Nations coming up in the next three years. That is where actually we have managed uh, colleagues of um, in my institute and, and internationally with the SKA office and so on to be able to put uh, mega constellations on the agenda of this big world conference. That is already a success. That is a one in a lifetime chance to actually have a regulation in place. And it would be really important if everyone in the world joins the efforts to, to have that um, uh, regulation in place. And the UK obviously plays a major role in these discussions. So it would be really good to, um, to, to find a solution to this. Thank you, Professor Kramer. Dr. Dempsey, anything you would like to add to that? No, I mean, I fully concur uh, with what, Ma what Michael is saying. And, and in fact, it was our LOFAR telescope that took some of the observations which um, confirmed that they, they, you know, we are seeing this, this very no this noise from uh, from these satellite constellations. And and if we wanted to talk, I mean, on an optimistic path to do with this, yes, the regulation needs to be there. Yes, there needs to be serious um, investment of collaboration from the all of the industries which are making noise and light if we want to see the sky. I'm seeing um, examples of those kinds of collaborations in the Netherlands. Um, we've gone, we're putting SKA in South Africa 
and Australia for a reason, right? It's as far as we can possibly get away from civilization because every part of our civilization now makes radio noise. Um, and yet we have a telescope, one of the most sensitive in the world at these frequencies operating in the heart of Europe. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. Ten years ago, it was predicted LOFAR would not be able to hear or see the sky at all. Uh, and part of that um, success has come from the engagement with um, the 5G networks, uh, with the wind farms, which make noise, which the solar farms, and them agreeing to make adaptions and changes um, to their systems in order to comply with the level of radio silence in the frequency bands we need. And so these are examples where if you have that engagement and investment um, with the, the local industries or the industries that are doing this and you have enough support at governmental levels to do so, there are ways to mitigate things which otherwise would be prohibitive. Uh, and so this is possible. We, we, we're already uh, innovating along a whole host of different ways to filter out noise. Uh, and these are all directly with commercial and societal applications as well. Uh, so a lot of these have then had knock-on um, benefits uh, in, in unexpected ways. Uh, so it needs to have that, not just regulation, but you have to have that buy-in uh, from the industries uh, that, are, that are causing this in order for these things to be successful. But there are examples where that does happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. Uh, Catherine Fletcher and then James Davis. Um, uh, esteemed professors, I appreciate your time very much on this. It's, uh, it's been a really interesting inquiry. And, and one of our roles is about kind of almost joining the dots back up. So AI is something that we've been particularly interested in. And I'd like to get your thoughts and views on what role AI is kind of playing in astronomy. I mean, Dr. Kramer... Um, are you you talked earlier in your evidence about kind of react needing projects to be able to react to innovations? I think AI comes under that bucket, doesn't it? Absolutely, no, no, com completely correct question. Actually, when I was still in Manchester, uh, we were one of the first to actually start to use machine learning to look at the flood of data that we uh, get from our telescopes to identify the objects that we want to find in in, in the in the noise that comes from every direction. And it has only become more important ever since. And, and nowadays, when we do an experiment in South Africa at the Mirka Telescope, which is a precursor to SKA, we basically collect three petabytes of data every night. In the past, we had PhD students going through this data to sort out the, the interesting signals from, from the noise. That's not possible anymore. We cannot save the data. So it has to be online and machine learning and neural networks and everything, artificial intelligence. Is, is, is without that it wouldn't work anymore. And there are many other countless examples in astronomy where this flood of data that we are now facing, which is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but it also comes with challenges. And these challenges are indeed we have to deploy machine learning and artificial intelligence. The only problem and risk that, that is clearly there is astronomy is a discovery science. It's uh, we do often- Let me swap, sorry, I missed you, forgive us. So astronomy is a discovery science. We, the, the biggest insight in physics and astrophysics com were completely unexpected because of some serendipitous discovery. And now we have to make sure that the artificial intelligence that we sort of pass on the data to uh, don't miss over, sk skip over or misses the, the, the unexpected because we need to train the artificial intelligence. We need to make sure it, it it's really identifies the interesting signal. And that is a big challenge. But on the other hand, again, there are some interesting uh, industrial applications. So there are many methods we can develop in astronomy and astrophysics that can find implications in, in society. For instance, smart cities will have the same amount of data that radio telescopes have today. And you may want to find a glitch in a power grid. You may want to find that particular problem somewhere in the data. And with the methods that we develop in astrophysics and astronomy, you have the same tools at your hand that you can also apply at other interesting projects. Or autonomous uh, car driving, the amount of data you receive and you have to process wouldn't be possible with, with artificial intelligence. But astronomy today, in particular radio astronomy, already has this data set to do this training, to learn the methods. So I think we can play an important role here. What does your government think about it? Because the governments around the world are getting together, you know, two areas of concern, or at least, you know, in terms of the safety, 
but also you know the size of the checks that need to be written to process that map data if i can put it in mancunian to make you feel slightly at home um what how does how do you how does your institution get on with government do you feel supported um Yes and no. I think there can always be done more, but having received a check over 1.3 billion euros to build a center, which one of the pillars is based on data science and artificial intelligence, is not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, compared to the money spent somewhere else on this area, not in astrophysics, um, there could be more. Um, but I think the, 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 the nice thing about ast astronomy is our data don't have any uh, problems with data security and data privacy. So that's why companies like SAP, that's one of the biggest software companies in, in the world, came to us and asked, can we use your big data sets to try our methods and algorithms? Because they didn't have to worry about data privacy issues. And so I think there can be a link again. If industry understands that we have the data sets that they can work with and government funds this, I think that would be ideal. So I think I won't complain uh, that there isn't enough funding, but there can always be more. Well, that's fair enough. Dr. Dempsey, um, I mean, what, 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 what would you contribute on that? Is there any, any reservations from your perspective? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to give quite a different perspective, <laughs> uh, Michael, actually. Um, I'm very cynical about the AI, AI um Funding the hand, you know, the numbers, the questions that are being asked right now are actually going to suck the air out of the room funding wise. Uh, I don't think it does. Radio astronomy is only the first, and, and this Michael put very well, the first of many, both research um, challenges that are just going to hit data bottlenecks now. Uh, and that before now, um, in astronomy, the precious commodity was hours of time on the sky with the telescope. Um, with red, with SKA, with LOFAR already, that's not the case. It's how can you afford to reduce the data? Can you afford the processing? Can you afford the data footprint to keep it somewhere? And so this is already a big paradigm shift. The the amount of money required, AI won't solve this on the timescale <laughs> we need. And so we need to be looking very carefully at where these funds are going uh, and I don't necessarily think all of it going into AI um, because of the opportunity matrix is going to give us back potentially everything we need. And on the other part of this, with the scale of the data need, so does the energy and the carbon footprint. Uh, up until now in astronomy, every time we make an efficiency gain in our algorithms, we use it to do more science uh, in, and consequently increase our footprint. Uh, so if we were going to look at sustainable or green astronomy, uh, then, you know, these are just ever expanding numbers. And so if we're looking at trying to make sure we are accountable in terms of our footprint and our energy budgets, as well as the costs, because they're, of course, completely aligned, uh, then we do have to be far more strategic uh, about where we put our gains and, and what we decide to do on these limits, because it will be the energy budgets of our data processing and our archives that will be where that major cost is in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm just very cynical about whether AI on the timescales we need is going to be, it should be where we're putting all of our funds uh, in terms of figuring that out. No, no, it's a very interesting point. What would you suggest an alternative rather than investment in AI at this scale if if the, the discovery in, is still the primary goal? Green compute. We need to be looking at actually really investing in the technology developments on every part of the data collection chain. How do we turn those green? Because every time we make an efficiency... Oh, so, right, no, I understand. So it's it's kind of a mechanical improvement in the data process rather than an alternative credit to collecting mass data sets. Yes, we actually yeah. do need to... And not just, not just mechanical, but algorithmic. Uh, and some of these can be... So, you know, AI is going to help us there, uh, but it won't be the only solution. Uh, so I think we need to have a broader... A strategic view on making this, minimizing these footprints, maximizing our output, and also making sure it's got the minimum footprint. AI has that huge, huge energy demand. Yeah. Uh, and that's why looking at putting these factories where you can actually generate the energy to do so. Um, and my my worry is uh, that that's just an ever-expanding uh, void into which we, we're pouring money. And I want to make sure that we're having the outcomes from that uh, that we need. Understood. So, um, on a scale, you, I'm, I'm being slightly daft, but you either need a nuclear reactor in the Sahara or a t next to do with a telescope from the data center or a huge solar farm, or you need to start providing the energy for the storage and production of these data sets 
in a sustainable way. Yeah, OK, understood. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, James Davis uh, and then Graham Strong. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested in the access that amateur astronomers have to facilities in your uh, countries, such as observatories, planetaria and radio astronomy uh, facilities. Uh, perhaps if we could start with Professor Kramer in relation to Germany. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I think that's something Germany can actually be very proud of. We have about, uh, well, 40 or 50 planetaria across Germany, which can host more than 50 people. We have 10, which can host more than 300 people. Mm -hmm. They get hundreds and thousands of visitors. And we have this small popular observatories, which are mostly done by amateur astronomers, where you can actually get to the telescope and observe. These are usually small telescopes, but not all of them. So some of them are, are sizable. Um, and uh, when Germany is not the best country to ob observe the optical sky sometimes, um, just like Manchester. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the popular, uh, the, the people are really drawn to this. Uh, last year we had a, we actually had a, uh, something funded by the ministry. We had built a movable planetarium. We went to the pedestrian zones in the uh, cities in Germany and, and really also wanted to direct people into the planetarium that usually wouldn't go there. So that was a huge success. We had 60,000 people just on, on that particular tour across Germany. And we also do teacher training. So we make sure that uh, there is an organized uh, teacher training mm -hmm. across the country where we invite uh, teachers from high school um, to, to, to tell them how to we put also uh, research results to, to, to the school children and so on. Yes. Um, what we haven't done very well is, I think, to uh, bring the public to participate in uh, real uh, optical and radio astronomical research. Radio astronomy is, uh, you can do only so many things with a telescope. It also doesn't have to quite appeal to the public because you only see some data stream coming out. You can't see it with your own eyes. There's nothing mm -hmm. better than actually going, looking through a telescope and see the stars or stars or Jupiter or Saturn with your own eyes. But in principle, this is something that is very well developed in Germany. Just this morning, I got an invitation to participate in teacher training again. And um, we also have the House of Astronomy in Heidelberg, which organizes teacher training in, in Germany. They are also hosting the IU, the International Astronomical Union Office of Education. So this is something taken very serious in Germany. And I think that is something we can really be proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've touched there, obviously, on the public outreach that takes place in in Germany. And do you have any comment on the particular methods that work in engaging the public and school children? I know you've talked about some of those in place, but how, how can, can those efforts best work? I think the, you will be amazed if you, give a, if you give a talk at school, even at primary schools, the questions that you receive from these children are amazing. They are really amazing. They want to know about black holes. They want to know about stars. And they're, they're very intelligent questions, sometimes so intelligent that you have to think about the answer for a while. Uh, and so exposing these kids at, at this very young age to astronomy is really a draw into, uh, into a STEM uh, fields later on. We see this all the time. So uh, I think the engage them with, with nice pictures, maybe planetarium, trying to show them uh, aliens is always a favorite topic, of course, uh, trying to uh, teach them about the uh, fascination of the universe. And uh, it, someone said the, the most uh, attractive things are dinosaurs and, and, mm. and space. And I think that is actually true. Yeah. And so in uh, by uh, getting these uh, school children very early, I think we can draw them into, into STEM research and they may not become astronomers, but they will certainly be interested in natural sciences and engineering and so on. Mm. So uh, I think you, there's almost nothing that will be, that wouldn't work if you try to uh, uh, excite them because they're, they're, they're really, really fascinated by this subject. Very good. Uh, Dr. Dempsey, Netherlands, um, what is the state of play with access to facilities for amateur astronomers and, and how developed are the relationships between professional and amateur astronomers? 
Oh, it's it's very comprehensive. Uh, I think I would second uh, Michael on one thing, which is I, I can't. There's not many places worse for optical astronomy than the Netherlands, uh, and so you know we're quite limited in terms of the the size of the optical facilities, uh, and and with the radio facilities, um, one of the examples is is directly outside of my office window, the Dwingelo Telescope, which uh, was first built in the 1950s. And hasn't really been scientifically competitive uh, since the 1990s, however, was taken over by a group of, of retired uh, Astron employees and, and they renovated it. They found the funding and they renovated it. It is now a public access uh, facility that they allow any amateur stu and student astronomers to use. Mm -hmm. uh, the renovation makes it look, I think, better than it was when it was originally done. Uh, it is nearly operating every single day. They're incredibly invested. Uh, and in the summer, which we're just going into, uh, they have thousands of uh, visitors that come and do this, and they have they track satellite, cube satellites. They tracked the Artemis mission, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it went to the moon. Uh, so it's an incredibly uh, active uh, group uh, and I think this really is what you see uh, with the, these amateur groups, which when they're engaged and supported by uh, the professional uh, astronomy of the of, of either a region or a nation, they just are self-propelling. Mm. And and so if you can give them that support, and it doesn't need to be necessarily very large monetarily, uh, they really do uh, enable an entire other engagement set than most professional astronomers have either time for. Or potentially interesting. Yes. And how do you feel public outreach uh, is working in the Netherlands in general? And, and again, what kind of methods do you think work best? I, I think it's an incredibly um, diverse and, and high level of engagement. And I'm, I'm very impressed here in the Netherlands with the diversity of the types of engagement. Uh, an example is in Nijmegen, uh, they've just done this very heavy uh, indigenous art exhibit focusing on black holes. Uh, and so it's a combination of artists, it's a combination of written work and the uh, Black Ho the Event Horizon Telescope uh, discovery space. Uh, so they're very creative. And this, uh, like Michael mentioned, makes it accessible to people who wouldn't have otherwise maybe just turned up for an astronomy talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so having these kinds of uh, collaborations with artists, with the writers, I've seen a lot of very successful ones, really does uh, broaden uh, the engagement set from from the typical uh, that you might say just from from general outreach talks, which while I think are vital, I think they shouldn't be the whole suite of uh, ways we engage. Uh, some of the other interesting ones are I'm really I, I learned this in Hawaii um, is community engagement doesn't necessarily mean scientists talking at the community about astronomy, but just being a better community member and therefore you just get to be part of that community. We also did open up the, astron uh, the telescopes on Mauna Kea for high school students to actually ask for observing time. Uh, and this was an incredibly successful program. Uh, and, and Michael already mentioned that, you know, uh, kids end up, you know, really surpassing your expectations. We thought they were going to come up with some very basic requests. Some of these uh, programs that got awarded some time were so ambitious, we couldn't do them with the best telescopes in the world. Uh, and some of them, these high school students, even published uh, scientific research papers uh, with their uh, graduate students in, in the universities. So it was really, um, a really impressive uh, a way to engage. And those, some of those students, uh, uh, and Michael mentioned as well, you know, ended up being not just going directly into astronomy, but staying in STEM where perhaps they wouldn't have otherwise because they had such an authentic early experience. Right. Thank you very much for that comprehensive reply. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, Graham Stringer uh, and then Stephen Metcalf. What has happened to funding over the last 10 years in the Netherlands and Germany? If I can start with Dr. Dempsey, has it increased or decreased or, say, level in real terms? Uh, I have only really come into the landscape uh, recently, but of course um, I have uh, been picking up on my history quite quickly. I think it has been quite steady uh, and we have had significant um, wins and I would call it the square kilometre array uh, investment. Uh, so we are members of uh, the Netherlands. Um, that's uh, that for the Netherlands, who's you know a limited budget compared to both Germany and the UK. That was a very significant additional investment to the portfolio. Um, and so I would say that it has been um, 
quite steady uh, with uh, you know, really consistent success uh, across both the optical infrared uh, and radio astronomy regimes. Dr. Kramer? Yeah, in Germany, I think uh, the research funding in general, uh, not just related to astronomy, has increased significantly over the last 15 years or so. Uh, got the governments across different uh, constellations have increased with the so-called Pact of Innovation and Research, the research budget uh, between 3 to 4% for the last 15 years every year. So that is something that uh, I think was very important. If you would now look at astrophysics and astronomy in general, I think the funding has to have been level funding, which means in real terms, of course, because of inflation, everything, there has been less money in the system uh, generally. I mean, the, the last, as I said, the funding of this national center is, of course, a welcome boost. Um, so I, I think we are complaining probably on a from a very high level. Um, but uh, in terms of research in general, it has increased. In terms of astrophysics, probably has been level funding or reduced real-term uh, effect. Dr. Kramer, one of the professorial predecessors of yourself at Manchester University was Lord Rutherford, who um, said, we have no money, uh, therefore we have to think. Is there a future uh, for astronomy uh, that isn't uh, using very expensive kit and very expensive AI. Is there a low-cost uh, future for astronomy? There is. There are some niches, I think, where uh, the unexpected discovery or new insight will always be uh, possible. But it is unfortunately true that the uh, machines that we need to make the discoveries getting bigger and bigger Unlike maybe some machines in other sciences, our telescopes are observatories, so they're multi-purpose instruments, and which means um, you may have a great idea and you go to the telescope and find something unexpected that the telescope was not built for. I think if you go to any telescope, the biggest discovery of that particular telescope was not the one that was envisioned when it was built for. And I think um, that is uh, something that is very important to keep in mind. And the new telescopes, yes, they get more big, they get bigger and more expensive, but they also shift the parameter space that you are exploring and you discover really great new insight in our physical world, not just in, 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 in astrophysics, but in the fundamental laws of physics in, in general. Think about dark energy, dark matter, which we still don't understand. Um, so as much as I would like to say, yes, you can do some uh, um, uh, search that uh, can be done on a shoestring, I think the fact is that international the competition is so high that you would be outperformed by these new facilities. And if you're not part of this, I think you're missing some of the most exciting uh, results. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic that this will be possible. Thank you, Dr. Dempsey, on the same question. I mean, the short answer is not, if we want to be competitive. Uh, I am, though, um, a proponent of the fact that just asking for something but a little bit bigger without any thought as to why, uh, you know, that's gone the way of the, of, you know, the dinosaurs. We have to now be far more strategic uh, in uh, the way we step forward into these larger facilities. And I am particularly um, believe in this it has to do a hundred things for a hundred different science cases. Right now, if you're going to invest, you have to demonstrate that this isn't an experiment that one person is going to get, you know, an accolade. Gone are the days of that individual scientist writing a paper and a Nobel Prize being a justification for the scales of funding we're talking about. And so the discovery engines of the future aren't just going to be driven by scientific greed, bigger, better, faster, stronger. They need to open up new dimensionality. They also need to be demonstrating that they're going to meet the needs of a whole range of the scientists in, in the community. And finally, I think on the days of these single country investments, you see the SKA, you see how many countries have said, yes, this is a priority for us. Uh, and so you have to have these robust international uh, collaborations and you, you have to share. And I think that those are the things that will meet the success needs for, you know, competitive astronomy in the future. They aren't cheap, but we have to make sure we're not wasteful 
Uh, and that's where I think, you know, that competitive nature of, well, let's just all build one and, and let's see, you know, may the best person win. We have to now move towards saying these scales of the facility are too large uh, and, the, and the funding needs too great uh, for us to do that. So I do think there's a little bit of a paradigm shift needed, uh, but we have to make sure that if we're going to invest in these beautiful big toys, that's a toy that lasts us for two generations at least. Thank you. You've both mentioned um, the career insec insecurity there is for postdoctorals because of the uh, difficulty getting permanent positions and uh, the short-term nature of the, the initial contracts. And you've also said that it's easy to inspire dinosaurs and space, and that's true. How do you give it? But given that insecurity, what vision do you give of astronomy uh, in the future to somebody on their second or third year of a PhD course to say astronomy is uh, a great career for you? There's this level of insecurity, but there's real excitement out there. How do you inspire those uh, doctoral students? Dr. Kramer. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think the motivation is almost there by themselves. They are very inspired. I think the fair thing you have to tell them is that uh, the number of positions is limited. We're producing many more PhD students and uh, degrees that there are positions in, in the system. Um, but they're, of course, with their skill sets and their training, they are very useful for a lot of different careers and many move in these different careers. So I think the main point is to be very honest and then be telling this. Um, what I'm missing in the German system, which I think is actually great in the UK system, I have to say, and I enjoyed this myself, is you have a career path in the UK that we don't have in Germany. You have at the universities, you can start as a lecturer, you can move to senior lecturer, reader, professor, and so on. That career path doesn't exist in Germany. And so for, for me, I think when I talk to my students, I, I tell them, look, you, you either have to prepare to move around until you find that position, which is exciting by itself because you meet new people, cultures and all the benefits that come with it. Um, and, and, and that's actually also part of the motivation because you work with this incredible bright people across the world from different backgrounds, different cultures. I think that is one of the motivations to actually do astrophysics because it is a collaborative research. Um, but uh, I, I think the you need to be flexible. Uh, we would like to have many more permanent positions and give them certain career paths in Germany. But unfortunately, uh, it doesn't exist in this country, which is really a shame. Um, so this is something the UK is really um, much better off, in my opinion, I would say. Thank you. Dr. Dempsey? Yes, I mean, I think that in the Netherlands, there's a couple of very interesting conversations happening. Uh, I'm very um, sensitive to this. I'm, 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 I wasn't an astrophysicist by training, but I drifted into instrumentation. Um, this, because I liked building these things with my hands, I enjoyed that. That was actually very damaging on an academic career scale because when you're building instruments, you're not publishing enough to be competitive with people who are just sitting crunching data and producing 10 papers a year. And so I'm very sensitive to the fact that we need to provide different kinds of recognition for different breadths, um, ju not just the pure academic research in astronomy, because we need instrument builders too. We need the ones who are interested in the software and the algorithms uh, and do want to do all of this sort of thing. So there's a re reward and recognition analysis going on right now within the whole Dutch research infrastructure, not just astronomy, with the recognition that we need to change the way we reward and not just reward publication citations uh, and, and the sort of traditional scientific metrics. Uh, we know that this unfairly also uh, helps certain demographics over others. Uh, women uh, and other underrepresented groups are also uh, more damaged uh, just by having these uh, different levels of, of reward. And so these are really interesting conversations that are going on. And we're seeing some changes at some of the universities. And these are things I'm now enacting at Astron to try and broaden the work first funnel because we're doing these incredible trainings and they're incredibly valuable people that we're losing out of the system when I need to keep them in something else. So trying to find and broaden viable career paths 
and give them opportunities to perhaps return back into academia after they've come out and, you know, helped build our telescopes. These are ways where I want to maybe have the system be a lot less wasteful. Um, and uh, and that's uh, something which is ongoing at the moment. Uh, and there's some good lessons to be learned, I think. Thank you. My, my final question, just in terms of sort of big long-term priorities, you said it's getting more and more uh, difficult to see into space, to uh, make observations from, from the Earth. For long-term investment, does that mean that in, in international collaboration we should be prioritising space-based telescopes rather than terrestrial telescopes, Dr mm -hmm. Dempsey? I mean, I think you might have seen some conversation recently about begging the world to keep the dark side of the moon uh, radio quiet. Um, this is the best platform uh, that we will have in the in the next century uh, for looking at space. Uh, and yet, of course, it's already with a second space race going on, potentially something we'll already perhaps lose the opportunity for. But there are already credible missions, both still on the moon already and, and about to go, which are going to sort of start to test um, this field. Uh, and I do think that we will be looking at the, the next generation, uh, both optical, but particularly in radio astronomy. We need to get above our ionosphere, not just above all the noise that we are making as humans, uh, if we want to really see uh, and open up that phase space uh, beyond what we have now. So it's definitely going to be um, the landscape of the future, both, I think, CubeSat arrays, compact arrays, and potentially missions to the moon. So I think that that is an important strategic uh, viewpoint. I know a lot of conversations um, in the in the astronomy world and the collaborations are happening around this. I think that will be the next generation of telescopes. Dr. Kramer? Yeah, I have a slightly different view. I think we are building instruments like the extremely large telescope uh, from the UP Southern Observatory, which will be almost 40 meters across. That will be the biggest and most powerful telescope in the world uh, for the next 10 years. The Americans will have nothing compared to it. And uh, that structure cannot be built in space. I think the uh, you can do amazing science from, from, from the right places on Earth still. Uh, mega constellations is something we have to worry about. But I think the in terms of building such a structure in space, the amount of money it would cost we really would then need to ask ourselves whether this is worth spending it. So I think there needs to be a mixture. There are certainly is room for certain space observatories as we have it today. I mean, the JWST is, has produces wonderful, uh, amazing results, unexpected results, but it was also the single most astronomical, most expensive astronomical instrument in the world by far. And, and I, I don't know how many of these instruments we can build uh, simultaneously. China apparently can do that quite well, um, not JWST style. But anyway, so my point is also from the training point of view, there's nothing in, in industry. The, having instruments on the ground, we, we can bring our industry there, we can build a diverse set of industry, different skills, we can train our people there, engineers, astronomers. So I think. Nothing will replace, I think, the importance of the ground-based facilities, but there is clearly some scope for space-based um, uh, instruments, as, as Dr. Dem Dempsey has uh, pointed out. But I think we need, still need the ground-based facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Graham. Um, Stephen Metcalf, and then finally, Rebecca Long-Bailey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, both. Um, if I may, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, diversity. And so, uh, Dr. Dempsey, you touched on this. I think it's fair, or we are told, one in five females uh, are, make up the workforce uh, in um, astronomy globally. It's maybe a bit better internationally, a bit poorer here in the UK. Does it matter that it's only one in five? Um, and if it does, why? <coughs> what can we do to improve that? And what's your experience as someone who has sort of been working in different places around the world? What's your experience of this and how can we improve it? Well, I mean, personally, I'm going to tell you it matters um, only because I've seen the waste and, and the damage because it's not one in five um, because there's not many women out there that want to do this. Uh, that's because the losses um, across the entire level of the career field are just greater for women. 
Uh, and that means that there's something broken in the system and it's biased in the system when we're losing women at a greater rate uh, at, at every single career stage. By the time you're at, at professorial or directorate level that I'm at, you know, you're down at more like 2%. Um, so it's uh, at senior levels, we, we lose them at, at a larger amount, very small numbers. And if you don't have the role models there, it's far harder uh, to to continue to get and, and recruit uh, into the system in the first place. Uh, so role models is the start, uh, and the second part of this is is literally training in in policy making to make sure that you don't lose women at each one of these stages. And it is perfectly possible. Uh, and so, for example, the systems that I put in place at JCMT in Hawaii, we went to gender equity across the entire organisation within eighteen months, uh, even in our technical fields. Uh, what we've just done at Astron is put in something called an equitable hiring campaign. Uh, so this is where uh, you, you look to your recruitment uh, processes, uh, first and foremost, and your retention, secondly. Uh, these are two things which have to go hand in hand. Uh, but I will say, you know, that these are systems which work and you can do that. Uh, so I do think that um, that there is a different experience for women in astronomy because of the small representation. And I would extend that to other underrepresented groups. Uh, not just women, uh, and you can tell the difference in the quality uh, and the experience and, in fact, the performance of groups that have worked to uh, make sure that they have representation and a more diverse group and that that group is then inclusive in how they're appreciated. Thank you. That is very helpful. Um, Professor Kramer, did you want to add anything to that from your own experiences? No, I think what uh, Dr. Dennis said is absolutely correct. And uh, this has been neglected for far too long in Germany, but there has been uh, major advances and it's not perfect. We can do much more. We should do much more. But for instance, Max Planck Society has a self-commitment that uh, there should be 30% uh, or 35% minimum uh, percentage of directors at the Max Planck Institute being uh, uh, women directors. Uh, we have excellence programs for uh, women candidates where we also make sure there are dual career options and fallback options if they don't make uh, the tenure track. So we try to give them security. It is not enough. We have to do more. But I think the this program is will install the role models that Dr. Dempsey was talking about. And from then on, we need to then also make sure that the lower levels are populated accordingly so that we have also bigger pools of diverse people we can draw upon. And, and, and that takes time, unfortunately. Sometimes uh, I'm amazed by this 18 months. I can only congratulate you, Jessica, for having done that. It, we find it much more difficult. It's a slow process, but it needs to be done. It, 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 it does matter. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much indeed. Rebecca long uh, Thank you. Just to build on um, what Stephen Metcalf has just been asking, um, could you let me know, Dr. Dempsey, what the position is in relation to diversity regarding people from a black and ethnic minority background and also broadening that also into the area of those who are from lower income backgrounds as well? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I can give you uh, stats off the top of my head for about 10 countries, but I mean, in the Netherlands, um, it's very problematic. Uh, it is not representative, particularly of the Dutch ethnic minorities, as they are acknowledged. We, they're just non-existent in, in the astronomy landscape. Uh, it is it's completely... Um, it's a completely uh, a non-existent profile beyond high school, uh, even if they're going into universities and not going into these scientific areas. Um, and I think it combines uh, both the fact that there is a bias in what they're experiencing in the high schools. It's also in the fact that they're generally in those lower income uh, mm. areas, in those lower income schools. So there is a compounding factor there. Uh, that I think causes that imbalance and that lack of representation. This is something which has been shown time and again in the US studies uh, and coming in Hawaii where we see Native Hawaiian uh, groups being the most, um, elite, mostly in the, the lower income to absolutely under the poverty line experience. Mm -hmm. These two things compound to mean that their representation uh, regardless of the fact that Hawaii's had astronomy for 60 years, we have less than 2% of the astronomers who are actually uh, have any Native Hawaiian um, background. Uh, there are efforts to change this, uh, but overcoming that 
that combination of, of the lower income uh, and lower education uh, opportunity level, we, we, we see less of them in astronomy and we also see a far lower than representative amount of people of colour and, and minority ethnic background in astronomy worldwide. Thank you. And Professor Kramer, what's the position in Germany? Yeah, I th I'm afraid it's very similar. I think we do have uh, a, a huge gap in terms of uh, ethnic diversity. We, we have a number of Asian background uh, colleagues in, in upper places. That's good. But the, the diversity aspect is something that uh, in astronomy in particular isn't very well uh, taken care of. I think more needs to be done. In terms of lower income, uh, fortunately, education in Germany is completely free. I mean, I was the first in my family to go to university. Uh, wouldn't be possible without it. Uh, so I think there are chances. Lower income uh, is, is maybe less of a problem than, than trying to help uh, the ethnic diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca. Can I thank uh, Dr. Dempsey and Professor Kramer very much for your evidence uh, today? Very clear, uh, very direct, and very helpful to our inquiry. So uh, thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you. I'm now going to introduce our next pair of witnesses uh, who are also appearing virtually. Uh, I, as they come on the screen, I'm very pleased to see that we have Professor Nicholas Thomas, uh, who is Professor of Experimental Physics uh, at the Physics Institute. Uh, of the University of Bern. Uh, Professor Thomas uh, has held a postdoc research fellowship at uh, ESA's Space Science Department, the European Space Agency, uh, and has been a principal investigator in the past on missions to Mars uh, and has worked on missions uh, to other planets, including Mercury and Venus. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that we have uh, Mr. Gabriele Cremonese, uh, who is a senior technologist uh, at the Astronomical Observatory uh, of the University of Padua in Italy uh, and uh, of the National Institute for Astrophysics. Um, uh, Mr. Cremonese has been principal investigator to several missions uh, as well, including also Mercury and Mars, uh, and belongs to ESA's uh, prospect science team. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, uh, for joining us uh, this morning. If I could start with a question perhaps to uh, Professor Thomas. Um, thinking in your experience about uh, relationships, international relationships and relationships within countries, um, what, what is required uh, to make sure that uh, science and instrumentation come together to contribute to international missions in which you're very experienced? Yes, there's, um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's, I'm, I'm quite honored to be, uh, to be, to be asked. Thank you. Um, the question about the, um, uh, about the relationships, um, there's, there are relationships that are necessary on many scales. Um, in, at the national level, um, it's important to have um, uh, good relationships with your with your space agency because you have they have to be aware that you're interested in proposing to a, to a particular mission or uh, proposing a particular experiment. Um, you have to have a good relationship and some knowledge, uh, a, a good knowledge, in fact, of the, of the capabilities of local industries. Um, in the case of Switzerland. Uh, a project, um, a, an instrumentation project, rec uh, receives money. And fifty percent of that money must go to industry. Uh, pretty, uh, there's there's a little bit of flexibility, but it's it's uh, it's a it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the international uh, collaborations need to be fostered because um, most instruments they they can't be funded by one country alone. And um, that's even true on planetary missions, which uh, typically have smaller smaller instruments than the big astronomy missions. Um, but uh, it, it's still it's still true that you have to have relationships with international colleagues uh, um, and knowing what they're capable of doing. So, for example, if I would like to have a power converter for my next experiment, then I will talk to um, my colleague in Spain or my colleague in Poland and see whether they're able to do this. And, and so, and knowing knowing that that relation, knowing that that uh, landscape is there, is an important part about uh, about trying to get yourself uh, into a position where you can propose for these uh, propose an instrument for a mission. 
That's very interesting. So to, to, to be successful in your endeavours, your, a lot of the skills that are needed are outside the lab, outside universities. Yeah. They're uh, skills of diplomacy and, uh, and attracting business investment, uh, I, I guess. So how do scientists starting out, presumably through PhDs and, and others, quite narrowly um, on papers and in labs, how do they develop these important um, uh, skills and attributes? This is a, this is a great question, and uh, you know, uh, as you're almost as you're aware, you know, we uh, we were briefed before the the uh, presentations here, um, and this this was a question that uh, that came up in the briefing, and I, and I had I spent some time thinking about it about how exactly is there is there a roadmap towards this, and it's actually very difficult to say that. Um, uh, one of the things that I that that I concluded is that. Um, the postdoctoral people who are who who are most likely to go into this direction are the ones that have been playing around with data um, on a previous mission um, in in some way or another, and they're asking themselves questions or saying to themselves, "It would be nice if I knew this. It would be a lot better if I knew this. I could I could really do something if I knew this." And then they start to think they take it a little step further and say, "Yes, but what type of instrument?" What I need to build in order to get that information. And the minute that you ask yourself that question, you're already starting to think to yourself, well, what type of instrument am I, uh, you know, you're, they're beginning to move along, uh, away from being a pure data analyst towards thinking to themselves, well, could I get it? Could I get an instrument built? Indeed. And that's the first, one of the first steps. Now, clearly, that's already telling you that somebody has to be in the field at PhD level and postdoc level, and to be starting to ask themselves these questions, um, and then they have to collect the uh, the experience uh, that says, "Well, can you know? I'm I don't know about how to build space instrumentation. Where do I get it? Well, you go to a place that that uh, that allows you to to start looking and seeing what can be done. And that means going to places like S Tech, as I did uh, myself." Um, several other people that I know also also did fellowships with uh, with the European Space Agency, but also in in my case I went to a Max Planck Institute. Uh, as Professor Kramer is on there, I was at the Max Planck Institute for Aeronomy, as it was. It's now the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in, in Göttingen, and this institute was was quite famous for building space hardware, and then you you collect that experience, and so. Um, Making sure that people can move around to uh, to collect this experience is also an important element of this. Well, that, that, that's very interesting, and perhaps kind of leads on to my follow up question. What you described, in some ways, are kind of almost entrepreneurial skills on the part of scientists if they want to uh, advance. They're kind of prospecting for for contacts and uh, influence. But can public policy help you know, support or provide a? Uh, some scaffolding to um, uh, to assist that. Yes, I think that there are certain things. I mean, the, f the first thing is, is is very obvious. You know, to, to provide funding to allow uh, to allow people to go uh, to to the places that they want to go to for um, for for research. You know, rather like the Swiss National Science Foundation um, has a postdoc mobility grant. I think I think the same thing exists in the UK, but I, I haven't lived in the UK now for nearly nearly 40 years, and so I'm, I'm not so familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation has this post-op mobility, which allows people to come and say, I want to spend 18 months at Caltech. Um, and uh, they can go out there and, and, and gain experience. So that's one thing that you can do. The other thing is that um, uh, one thing that the Americans do is that they they train up their 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 people to become principal investigators. They have they have programs which teach people to become principal investigators of, of for instruments. And we don't actually do that in Europe. We certainly don't do it in Switzerland. I, when I did my first PI, PI job, um, I, I was, it was totally learning by doing, um, and mistakes were made. Um, uh, but uh, you know that's that that that's how it was. I survived. Um, but nonetheless, it would be better if there was an, a, some some sort of educational program. I think for this, 
The European Space Agency ought to be the right address for this, but the European Space Agency often takes the position that it's responsible for building the spacecraft, and the instruments are the national agency's responsibility. Mm. And so they say, well, it's your job, you should go away and do that. Um, I don't happen to agree with that. I think the European Space Agency should pick up that and uh, should pick up that role and, and, and try to educate future PIs. Very interesting. So um, it, it's sometimes described, uh, Professor um, Sir Jim MacDonald, for example, in, in Glasgow, sometimes talks about a triple helix uh, of funding, uh, bringing together the public public sector, universities and industry. That seems to be kind of what you're describing as what's necessary for success in, uh, in this field. Yeah, you, I think that... Um, in our case in Switzerland, they've imposed the uh, requirement to, to have um, a significant fraction of industry, uh, a significant uh, uh, part of the financing going to industry. Um, and that has, um, you know, it, it, it has its good sides, and some, but it can, sometimes, it can sometimes go wrong, uh, particularly if industry how is required. I'm sorry? Sorry, I cut you off. I think you've got to explain how it can go wrong. <laughs> You're yes. right. I was going to try. The, um, <laughs> the ways in which it, th this can go wrong is that if you try to put out, put out something to industry which is not really terribly well developed or, or requires a really significant amount of R&D in order to make it work, because a lot of the time we're doing very new things. Um, we're we're putting things in very new environments and so on. And it's not a given that industry has the expertise to be able to do that. And the universities, um, because they know exactly what they want, are often in a better position to do that. Um, and that was actually, uh, you know, the one thing that we, we now do is that um, we're building an, uh, a new instrument for um, Comet Interceptor, which is a, an ESA uh, uh, small mission uh, called an F-class mission. And... Um, we're building the building the main imaging system for this uh, for this mission, and we're getting the telescope, so the uh, the uh, carbon fiber structure and the mirrors and so on, all integrated. We're getting that from industry because they're very good at that, and they they know how to do that. There's some changes that need to be made, so they get some engineering work as well, and that all fits together very very well, and they can deliver that, and that should work really nicely. But if you want to get them to do um, uh, new really new developments, um, this this tends to be a little bit more challenging. I see. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's um, a fascinating insight. Um, uh, James Davis, I think, has got some questions to uh, Mr. Cremonese. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Mr. Cremonese, in Italy, how joined up is the space and astronomy sector in terms of research, technology and government support? Oh, I think we've lost your sound, uh, Mr. Cremonese. I don't know whether it's our end or yours. I can hear you, Gabriella, but you need to speak closer to the microphone. Okay, I can try now. Yeah. No, no, we no, don't. Um, no, we don't have it. Um, it's very quiet. So that's the problem. Uh, I, I try to be uh, to speak louder. Is it okay? Mm. No, it's not. I'm afraid. Um, is there anything we can do with our technical? No. I, is there anything your end you can you can tinker with? Mic volume. Okay, I can try now. I change yeah. something with the setup. Is it okay? No. Um, hmm. I'm afraid we we can't we can't hear you. In no, the, that uh, is a in the problem. Um, I, I don't know, perhaps, if I, if I switch to Professor Thomas just while we uh, figure out whether there's a solution, yes. uh, simply to ask that uh, where there are national launch capabilities, what advantages uh, does that give to astronomers? I, I, okay, I, can, I, get, I got the, the question. Uh, I'm afraid, Mr. Cromer, we can't hear. We can see your lips moving, but that's uh, that's it. So I think that if uh, if, if I direct if, that uh, question, Professor Thomas takes that question, question and then um, yeah. we we might try the telephone or something like that, um, um, uh, perhaps. But um, uh, James said okay. um, to Professor Thomas, yeah, national launch capabilities. Yes. Um, yeah. There's um, Switzerland, of course, is a, a, a relatively small country. You know, it's one eighth of the size of the UK population-wise. 
and our spending on 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 space is 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 probably about a third or a quarter of what the UK spends, something of something of this sort. Um, and so, you know, there's no um, national launch program. There were some startup companies that uh, there was a startup company called S3, which uh, started up in in uh, around about 2014, I believe. But this went bankrupt relatively quickly in 2018. Um, so it, it's not something um, at the moment that uh, that that we that, that we think is really viable at a national level for 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 Switzerland. Mm. Um, you, you, um, I, I, in general, as well, um, if you want to get into that market, it is very competitive now, and so it's going to. Re- it, in order to get into that market, it requires quite significant investment yes. and a large amount of. Uh, a large amount of uh, uh, um, uh, customers for that for that activity, mm. and you have to guarantee that. So checking the market is very important. So it's difficult to deliver in particularly in smaller countries, but it does give big advantages to astronomers. I presume you would agree where where it is possible. Yes, and yes. Uh, I, I, of, of course. I mean, we yeah. uh, we we've also tried. Um, rather hard to to look at ways in which Switzerland can expand its palette of things towards the towards the higher end. So building spacecraft um, and, and so on. Um, uh, we've we've looked at that and done some uh, done some activities in that area. Uh, but if you're able to to launch uh, launch your own launch your own spacecraft. Um, yes, this has has advantages mm. um, for uh, particularly for looking at some of these niche areas that uh, uh, Professor Kramer was talking about a little bit earlier. Yes, um, the, uh, we found one of these uh, uh, things in uh, one of these niches with a program called Keops, which was um, uh, a, a joint program between Switzerland and the European Space Agency. It's a low cost mission. It was a 50 million for, from Switzerland, approximately 50 million from the European Space Agency. And it was uh, following up uh, transits of uh, planets across the faces of stars and uh, monitoring this. Um, and it's it's done a great deal of work for a relatively, relatively cheap in a niche in a niche area. And uh, those, but there we're not launching it. We are, we're just simply there. Um, having bilateral agreements with with people that can launch for us. Mm. Okay, let's try bringing in uh, Mr. Cremonesi. Say, so you, you know, you've got your headphones on. Whether that's making a difference? Um, um, can, can you say something to us? Yes. Uh, oh, that's better. Can you can you hear me better now? We, we can. Yes, absolutely. Uh, James, do you want to uh, give your question to uh, yes. Mr. Cremonesi? I think uh, if we go back to the original question, uh, if that's okay, which was how well joined up is the Italian space and astronomy sector in terms of research, technology and government support? So uh, in Italy, I think that most of the space activities are directly funded by the National Space Agency, ASI. And then there is a research and development in the research institute and the universities. But uh, if you like to be involved in, in large projects uh, realizing big instruments aboard the space mission, for sure we have to uh, uh, work with the uh, ASI, with the National Space Agency, in order to get funding. And uh, I think that uh, it's very important at such a uh, point uh, uh, to have a stronger collaboration between the university, the research institute, because uh, I'm an employer of the research institute where I don't have the, the duty to teach. And uh, instead, of, instead of my uh, colleagues at the university, this is important uh, uh, to collaborate with the university because, uh, of course, uh, for my projects, the, my long term projects, I need uh, student, PhD students, and only thanks to the collaboration with the university is it possible to get uh, students and to get people uh, to pay for postdoc later on. Mm. So, uh, in, in any case, the space agency uh, can fund the realization, the operation related to the space instrument, but the research, the data analysis is more devoted to the research institute to the university. Even if sometimes the funding that we get for the large project for the space instrument are enough also to, to have a research, to make a research. 
mm. and to prepare the observation and to analyze the data that will be acquired by the instruments. Okay, thank you. And from your understanding, what could the UK learn from the Italian approach? So I think that uh, one important uh, important point is, for instance, how uh, the people can stay with us without having their permanent position. I mean, uh, in Italy, we can uh, pay for six years a, port, a postdoc, and then there is another kind of contract after the PhD that is the fixed term research without any limits. It means that I can pay for 10 years a people working on, this, on my project. This is very important because, for instance, I'm strongly involved in the Bepi Colombo mission, started 24 years ago, and uh, will arrive to Mercury just in a couple of years. It means that uh, if I had to change every three years the postdoc, it would be it would be a nightmare to me because every three years I have to hire new people, I have to educate, to to teach. To the people uh, in order to have the right experience and competence that they need for the project. I think that uh, uh, the most important point is the uh, 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 possibility to pay postdoc for longer times mm -hmm. in order to have uh, prepare people in order to arrive to the target of the mission with the people that uh, started with me at the beginning or just in the middle of the project. Thank you. And finally, from me, if I can go back to the second question, which is about national launch capabilities <coughs> and how useful they can be uh, to astronomers. Your perspective on that, please. So in Italy, we have uh, a, small, a small launch capability, or we have to ask to other uh, entities as a European Space Agency. I think that uh, could be important because uh, uh, there are large projects, large missions, but in such a case, if I, arrive, if I needed to validate some technology, if I needed to validate the new kind of instrument, uh, maybe I had to start with a small prototype. The small proto prototype means that it needs uh, a launch of a small satellite as a CubeSat. CubeSat are very well uh, Acknowledge in this time because several people, several groups try to get funding to get instrument on board CubeSat that could be launched also by small launch capability available also in Italy. And uh, in such a case, I can, uh, for instance, I'm a planetary scientist, I'm involved in a space mission to explore planets. But if I will be able to test, uh, to to realize a small prototype of the instrument to fly it in the CubeSat around the Earth, I will be able to validate uh, very well uh, my instrument that could be ready for other mission, deep space missions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, Rebecca Long Bailey, then Stephen Metcalf. Thank you. Um, Professor Thomas, one of the common themes across um, many countries that we've spoken to so far is the long certainty, long term certainty, should I say, of funding. Can you let us know if you face any challenges in the research that you're involved in yes. to ensure that funding extends for the entirety of a mission or programme from the early stages all the way through to data analysis? Yes, indeed, we, we do have problems. And I think it's a, it's one that is uh, quite common in, in Europe because there's a, a separation uh, between instrument development uh, operations and data exploitation. And what we see in Switzerland is that there is um, adequate and, in fact, well-coordinated funding for uh, the instrument development um, there's now uh, uh, something that's in, 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 in place for the operations of the instrument, but the, um, the data exploitation and the science from that exploitation um, is, is funded from a diff by a different entity. So there's a difference here between the, uh, the, the Swiss Space Office, which is under the ministry, which is responsible for, for, the, uh, for the instrument development, and then, then there's the Swiss National Science Foundation. And there's a disconnect there. And that has resulted in, in some uh, difficulties, and I would say tension in the, in, in, in the, uh, uh, in, in the system. Um, and so, and it, it, it's particularly difficult because the 
Swiss National Science Foundation, quite rightly, is attempting to have um, uh, have um, uh, competition and 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 having tension between uh, between grant applications and proposals in order to try to make a choice and, and, and choose the best. But if you're an instrument developer, I think it was explained a, a little bit earlier by by uh, by Jessica as well. Um, if you're an instrument yeah. developer, you can be spending eight to ten years developing that instrument. And at that time, you're not uh, you're not uh, uh, devoted to 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 science and, and and writing research papers in anything like the the level that uh, that uh, your potential competitors are, and so that gives um, that gives a, a a problem in the competition area. But in in addition to that, it it's um, it it's also there's also a kind of a little bit of a uh, moral problem with it because you know getting these instruments onto spacecraft is not an easy thing and uh you 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 get challenges uh and 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 difficulties and uh sleepless nights of worrying about whether you're going to be able to make it or not and then at the end of it it says well okay you've done that uh the reason why you did it to 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 get the data we don't care that's it all right uh, and that's not that's not really a that's not really a great way to do business, I don't think. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Uh, Mr. Criminese, um we spoke in our previous session about the collaboration between business and research. And one area that often doesn't get the focus that it deserves is the um, application of astronomy technology into non-astronomical applications. So I wondered if you could let us know what support is available in Italy to translate astronom astro astronomy technology um, into non-astronomical applications. Uh, this is something that uh, is not uh, always where uh, uh, following this problem and in technology transfer. Uh, in our research institute, there is a small office in charge of technology transfer that uh, could be able to uh, adapt something that we realize for ground-based telescope or space uh, mission uh, for the daily life uh, for the public. And this is something that sometimes uh, happens, but not always, uh, because uh, sometimes we need more funding, because it's clear that uh, if we, we, we like to adapt an instrument, uh, to the daily life of the public, we need some funding to change something, to modify something, and uh, to teach to the people to use it. But uh, I think that uh, uh, something is possible if there is a collaboration with the private company, because the private company, of course, could be interested to the scientific purposes, but later on we need to, to have a, a gain or something. And uh, it means that uh, they need to transfer the, the instrument, the technology that we realize to the public, to other applications. And uh, sometimes it happens. Uh, for instance, during the pandemic a uh, couple of years ago, in our research institute, a few people that uh, are experts for astrobiological instrument for uh, something for exploration of Mars and the Moon, you or for dust sensor, dust detectors, uh, this instrument has been uh, changed to be used for other, any other buildings in the in the city to detect the virus, the virus for instance. And uh, it, it, then uh, there has been a patent uh, that uh, working in order to apply this specific instrument also to the daily life so that was very useful for during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Stephen Metcalf and then Graham Stringer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, both. Um, I want to change track slightly, if I may, and talk about um, the role of amateur astronomers in the, the overall uh, ecosystem. Um, I just wonder if you could both uh, describe uh, what role they play um, and whether or not they receive any kind of uh, active support uh, from their professional counterparts. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Nick, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and Nick works for me as well. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we we have lots of contacts with amateur astronomers, and indeed, some of our some of our staff are members of astronomy uh, amateur astronomy societies, and also help them with uh, with um, uh, observing strategies and, and and guidance about how to. Uh, how to get astronomical observations. So, 
Um, uh, and we also run an observatory on the Gornagrat, which is there for um, for amateur astronomers also that to to participating. It's a remote it's a remote uh, uh, telescope, but it's um, but nonetheless, you know, it's capable of doing doing things. There are a number of amateur um, uh, there are a number of telescopes that are run by amateurs as well around Switzerland, where um, with, that also there's one in Schwanden which doubles as a planetarium. Um, and is uh, open open to the public as well, where they give uh, they give presentations and so on. And that was basically done by uh, by private, you know, by by one person, as a matter of fact, who really who really energised that. Um, the the having access to um, to to data from coming down from space, and for example, from coming with the camera that we have currently running around Mars. The best that we can do with this is really to provide the data openly to amateurs who want to want to work with the data, and we we'll try to do that. Uh, there are there's a, a certain amount of time that we need to process the data before we can put it online, but we're doing that on, uh, with a with a delay of about you know a few months is is what we're managing to do right now um, after it's been verified and so on. So amateurs can then touch that. And you'll be aware of what the, some of the work that Chris Lintot has been doing um, with the citizen science. Mm -hmm. um, one of the programs uh, is called Planet 4, where they were looking at geysers <laughs> on the surface of Mars. And um, uh, one of my uh, previous postdocs is actually very heavily involved in that, Anna Portiankina, and her husband, Mikhail Ayer. And so we we try to support that as well, also by making data available and so on. Thank you. And just before I go to um, Gabrielli, um, what about the uh, other way round? Do amateur astronomers help you in any way? Do they collect data? Are they able to do observations on a grander scale, or is it a one-way traffic? It, it's not so. It's not so easy anymore. Um, you know, in, uh, we have uh, the Zimmerwald Observatory up here in in, in Bern, and that was where um, Paul Wild discovered discovered his comets from. Um, uh, but this was also, you, you, it's very difficult to do that anymore because the, pro, the the professionals are doing this now with all sky surveys and the like, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, and also for planetary. Um, for planetary activities, uh, all, all, all of those sort of low-hanging fruit are now being have been taken over to to a large extent by these large-scale observatories, <laughs> and so there's not that much transfer, at least in the planetary domain. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Gabrielli. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it depends for which object uh, uh, we interest in an astronomical point of view. I mean, if for variable objects, uh, the amateur can contribute, uh, scientifically contribute to our observation and analysis of something. And uh, because uh, even the small telescope, the small detector that uh, the amateurs have, there are a lot of uh, small observatories all over Italy. Uh, contributed to our science. Uh, and uh, for instance, if uh, we like to observe a comet that is a very variable object in the sky, it's not possible for the professional astronomer to get uh, uh, time at the telescope to continue to follow up the, the, the object. Instead of the amateurs with the small telescope, they can contribute to monitor some activity of an object. And uh, I wrote some papers together with the amateur, putting together the data uh, obtained by professional telescopes and by their instruments. And uh, at the same time, in uh, some uh, observatory, uh, professional observatories, we have uh, the amateur that may use the, our telescopes. Uh, and uh, in such a case, they may have uh, own research or they can contribute uh, with the research that we are making with using other telescopes abroad. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if I may, just before I hand back to the chair, can I ask about the, the work you do in um, public outreach? And I'm particularly interested in how you engage with schools, or particularly young people, perhaps, it doesn't necessarily have to be through schools, to sort of encourage the next generation of astronomers to get excited about the subject uh, and do it in a way that really engages them. Um, perhaps we'll start with you, Gabrielli. 
I think that uh, I may uh, tell about uh, uh, an event that we have uh, from a few years that are Olympic Games in Astronomy. Our National Institute organizes every year these games. It, for instance, this year, 13,000 of students from 400 schools all over Italy participated to these games. And uh, where there are questions of astronomy, and uh, of course, uh, it means that uh, we try to stimulate the interest of the young people, the young students, uh, to these science. And then uh, we have uh, other events uh, uh, for the public, not only for students, uh, because uh, our observatory is open sometimes in the evening, during the summer, in order to uh, for a visit of our instrument or our laboratories. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, there are several conferences that, as a scientist, I went to the amateur group or some town hall to have a conference uh, on the last results of on the space mission or something similar. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas. Yeah. Um, we were awarded um, around about 10 years ago a National Center for Competence in Research from the Swiss National Science Foundation, and this is called Planet S. Now, one of the things that these NCCRs can do is that they can put some money aside for communications and outreach. And so we've got a team um, that, that, is, uh, that is available to do, to do comms with, uh, and, and outreach activities. And so with that, we go and attend uh, um, uh, exhibitions and, and functions such as Fantasy Basel, where we're um, interacting with younger people. They're, they're, most of these, however, they're not quite school kids uh, anymore. They're, they're, uh, they're involved in things like cosplay and whatever. But they, they're, they're, they're also not merely interested in, in uh, science fiction, but in science fact as well. And they pay very close attention to, to the, the exhibition that we provide there and also the presentations that we do. The other things that we do within that uh, comms is that we have um, supported... Um, uh, a book. Now, in Switzerland, there's a book series called Globby. Now, um, Globby is a, is a character, and um, I think in the Netherlands they have one as well called Connie, a, a person who, who who goes around and does does many different things. And each book is dedicated to what uh, what Globby is uh, one of the things that Globby likes to do. And and we recently did one of these for with space. And it became, uh, for a short period of time, uh, the best-selling book in Switzerland. Mm. All right, which is quite quite remarkable. And we had the Vernissage, so the first presentation of the book at the uh, at the um, technical high school in in Zurich. There were three hundred people in this auditorium uh, where Globby was being presented, and Globby with a costume and whatever came. And these kids were shrieking. It's a hundred kids shrieking like that. It was really quite <laughs> quite. Uh, intensive, <laughs> um, but but it was it was great, and um, uh, it, it's um, these types of things are the sorts of things that we think work quite well with the kids, and it seems to work very well. It's a little bit difficult getting into the getting into the schools. Um, we can, of course, provide um, we can provide uh, um, materials uh, for the teachers, but it's. Um, it, it, it's uh, and, and we do, you know, we do try to do this when we can, um, but it's not uh, it's not something that we find we don't have infinite resources to be able to do that and numbers of people to go around and do that do those types of things for groups of, of, of twenty or so. As Gabriella says, the um, trying to hit things which um, have have a, a an impact over a larger number of people seems to be more effective. Than than uh, going in individually into the schools. That's not to say that you shouldn't do it. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's an important part of what we do. But it it I have the feeling that it's more more effective if you can do it. Uh, find a way in which you can do it over uh, to to touch a larger number of children. Okay, thank you. May May I add uh, one more point, please? please. Uh, yes, because I like to mention an example because uh, is for the last three years in the high school is mandatory to have uh, some kind of work outside the school that could be on science, technology, or business. I don't know. Our observatory, my observatory, has a telescopes on the mountain, 
and uh, we organized during the summer one or two weeks where students from high schools stay on the in the observatory for five days working at the telescope with the astronomers and then there, there are some teaching of our astronomers but uh, the interaction during all the day and in the night at the telescope with the student i think that is more exciting for them excellent yes it, um that sounds like a an absolutely fantastic opportunity oh, you know, but quite targeted to a relatively small number of people which i, I accept is one of the challenges. Um, the final question is really, uh, do you do any assessment of whether or not the outreach work that you do has changed any outcomes? Whether it's actually influenced anyone to go into a STEM subject or into astronomy, or whether it's just, you know, we've done it, tick that box, they've enjoyed the experience, but it hasn't actually been life-changing. This is incredibly challenging to do, as, you, as you're probably aware, um, uh, to try to get to get some estimate of the effect. And um, you know, the, the statistic that we do in, in Switzerland is that we we look at the number of visitors that are going to the to the various uh, things that we do and, and try to try to itemize that. But that's no indication of whether we've really whether we've really changed their lives, as you as you uh, as you were alluding to. The one thing that I that that I thought about um, uh, to, to answer this question, though, was one one statistic that I found rather unusual that that I've seen um, with us recently, and that is that Bern has um, uh, there's a, a lower number of students studying physics now than there were around about three four years ago, mm. and that's unusual because. Um, in the other universities in Switzerland, the number's actually gone up very slightly. And so we were thinking, well, we must be doing something wrong. But then it struck me that maybe we had done something right, but previously. And it dawned on me that um, in 2016, we made a really big effort to publicize the comet uh, mission Rosetta, because we had a, a, a Switzerland had a major instrument on Rosetta, and we made a big effort to publicize this. And also in 2019, we made a big effort to publicize the 50th anniversary of the moon landings because uh, the University of Bern had contributed an instrument to Apollo 11. Buzz Aldrin put a, a Bernie's uh, experiment mm. on the moon and brought it back again. Okay, And we made a, a really big play about this. And we did indeed see a rise in the number of students that were attending Bern in physics. And it's, it's regularly... One of the things that is uh, appears to be attractive about coming to Bern uh, to study physics. So maybe this this little drop that we're now seeing is a consequence of the fact that we haven't recently had a, a, a big um, a, a big thing that we can that we can say, "Hey, look at this! Isn't this wow?" And we haven't been able to do that in the past couple of years, and as a result, we're not quite getting as many students as we as we had. So maybe that's a, I don't know if that's an answer. To, the, to, the, to this particular thing, but but it's it's one of those things that we could take a look at. That's very helpful. Thank you. And finally, Gabriele? <laughs> um, yes, I completely agree with Nick. I mean, it depends for the, for the period. Sometimes uh, just after the Rosetta mission, for instance, many people were really interested to uh, to follow conference, to, to see new images. And this uh, is reflected also in the number of students that uh, we had uh, at the astronomy for the, for the astronomy degree. But uh, I think that uh, uh, something is changing uh, because uh, I have seen that uh, increase the number of students uh, started a degree in astronomy. And for instance, the moon exploration is something that is, is really stimulated the interest on it. And uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, with a colleague, uh, we made a statistic with a student at the end of the first period of the thesis, just uh, if they would be interested in the master degree on planetary sciences. And 60% of the students uh, are very interested to start the master degree in this uh, topic. So it means that uh, all uh, that uh, all the information that we have on the newspaper on uh, on the media about the moon exploration it, it has an effect on the student of the people. 
Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Graeme Stringer, uh, and then finally, Karen Monaghan. Uh, Professor Tom Thomas, in, in, in Switzerland, what is the route, if there is a standard route, into astronomy, astronomy technology? And how is that supported either by the universities or the state? Yeah, that's... Um we have technical high schools. These are ETH, uh, Zurich, and EPFL uh, in Lausanne. And they tend to focus on the technology. And I, I know that the central government is quite interested in, in, in ensuring that these technical high schools are developing technologies. And there's an attempt also to try to foster more crossover between technology development uh, and uh, the uh, astronomy and space sciences. Um, so this is one of the uh, one of the things, one of the ways that I would answer this. Um, the other thing I, I think is that um, technology development um, is, um, is is something as well that the universities do try to do, but it's a little bit difficult to make a uh, to. Um, there's a rather, um, I would say, there's a lack of trying to get the, of getting this across into industry. Uh, Gabriella was talking previously about patents and uh, and so on. These are this is true of us as well, but there's not that many of these. I would say that that uh, by comparison with some other fields, um, from from the experience that I have, I, I'm not sure that I entirely answered your question. Well, I, I don't know what's missing from the answer. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's fine. I'll take that. <laughs> is, is there anything you'd like to uh, add to that, Mr. Cohen? Uh, so, I think that, uh, uh, yes, uh, at the university, of course, we have the engineers' uh, degrees, uh, the science degrees. Uh, sometimes uh, we have PhD students at the same PhD school coming from engineer or astronomy. And in such a case, uh, we may start a project uh, where uh, are involved engineers from technological point of view, but also for scientists in the same team, in the same group. In my group, I have engineers, I have geologists, I have astronomers. And uh, this collaboration between different uh, people with different experiences is very important. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, uh, sometimes it may happen that uh, we have a PhD paid by the company, a private company. In such a case, uh, is more focused on some technological issue uh, that could be important for a uh, space instrument. In such a case, uh, the, the PhD student work uh, with the industry, but also with me uh, for the scientific uh, supervisor as a scientific supervisor, and this could be something useful, but uh, is quite rare, I would say, because the main problem, at least in Italy, is that uh, the big company, big uh, private company, are not so uh, interested to the research. Uh, they are not making research in, inside the industry, and this is something that is really missing for us. Thank you very much indeed, and finally, Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested in um, diversity and inclusion. Um, it, firstly, how successful are your countries in increasing diversity and inclusion in astronomy? And are you monitoring it in any particular way? Maybe start with Professor Thomas. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a big question. Um, in Switzerland, it's it's uh, really important. If I can just give you an example of this with my own university. Um, up until uh, just a, a few years ago, we had 18 physics professors at the university. They were all male. Right? And part of this was the consequence of the, um, of the fact that many were being employed between a period of about 1995 and 2005. Uh, and the, 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 there was no, there was the sensitivity to to this subject was, I would say, almost non-existent. Um, that's changed a lot, and now uh, with uh, when this, this group of people from uh, from the 1995 to 2005 generation, including myself, retire in the next few years, there's um, a, a, a great deal of uh, desire. 
I would say. It's, it's not pressure, it's desire from all of us to change that situation and increase, uh, increase the diversity at, uh, at, at high level. I mean, that's, that's, that's high level. And yeah. obviously, yeah. that's important in terms of role models. Yeah. What about um, undergraduate level? Um, right. I, I would like to, to um, b- before I go to undergraduate, I'd like to explain a little bit about, about PhD level, if I might. Mm-hmm. Yeah, please. And that, is, and, and that is that we are monitoring very closely within the scope of this National Centre for Competence in Research we're monitoring in planetary sciences in Switzerland uh, the gender balance with PhDs. And sure enough, we, we, we can recognize leaky pipelines in this very clearly. But it's currently at a stage where at the moment we have 40% uh, uh, female PhD students at the moment. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, that's already on a, on a good path. So you're increasing the pool uh, for the future. Now, at undergraduate level, um, we've done our first sort of surveys of this because we, we've seen a couple of things that, that were trying to, trying to establish um, a, a little bit better where gender imbalances st- are starting inside the system. And the way that we did this was that we, we asked all of our uh, senior people, the people that employ um, uh, masters and, uh, and, and PhD students, the students in in Switzerland they have to do a bachelor thesis, so it's a, it's it's only a small thing. It's only about five man weeks of work, but it's their first time where they touch research, and they do a master's thesis as part of their master's studies, and that's of course is quite substantially more. And we looked at the gender balance at bachelor level and at master level, and just asked that question, and it turned out that at bachelor level we were around about fifty fifty, and then at master level. Suddenly, the number of uh, the number of women dropped relative to the men, and we don't actually quite know why. But there's a lot of there's, it, it's uh, it, there's a relatively large number, and so these are the things now that we're trying to monitor and trying to get statistics on. So it would be really um, it would be really interesting for you to share some of those that data and statistics with us. But I wonder have have you done any follow up? with the ones that haven't gone on to master level and and asked some questions this is this is very very new to us because we did we did this study um it was really uh um three months ago I mean, three months ago is when we done it so um we're actually we were actually re- really surprised that at the moment we still don't know what to do okay uh, about but following up is indeed one of the things that we would like uh, I, I think that we should be doing uh, but we haven't yet decided how we're going to address that. Okay, because uh, my next this. question was going to be, and I'll, I'll come to Mr. Kremen and say in a in a second. But my next sure. question was be was going to be, have you uh, are there any particular um, tactics you have used that have been successful in order to increase the diversity? Um, I I think that. I wouldn't say that we've used a particular tactic, and I, it, we're still in a in a position where um, the individual uh, uh, professors and supervisors they choose their candidates, and we don't we don't mess around with saying you will choose this particular candidate under these conditions. So uh, there's a little bit of a sensitivity in that. Mm. Um, but I, I I will say that um, one thing that we that we do see is that there are um, the the female students do also sort of look at take a take a good look at the potential supervisors and see what the structure of their group is. Yeah, uh, and we do we do notice that, and so um, uh, but I wouldn't describe this as a tactic. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. thank you. And Mr. Cremonese, maybe the same sort of questions. How how are you um, encouraging diversity? How successful have you been? Uh, and any um, any tips you can offer on successes? Uh, so I think that is not easy to answer. Let me start on just to mention something because uh, from January in my observatory we have a new director that is a woman. This is the first time after 250 years. Mm. It means that something is changing. 
and uh, it's clear that uh, is attracting to have a director as a woman for the researchers, the young researchers, for instance, and uh, other women uh, involved in our observatory, in our uh, in astronomy. Uh, in our institute, the National Institute, the percentage of female is just around 35-36% and is not uh, increased too much in the last five years. But the main problem is that uh, there is another corresponding in the top level position. It means that uh, we don't have 35% uh, of female in top level position. Mm -hmm. This is something that uh, we have to correct for sure. And that it's very difficult to say how to proceed. And uh, I think that uh, this is something it takes uh, some time, of course, because now we are a lot of uh, uh, women as uh, new researchers, but uh, we have to wait some time in order to have uh, these women in top level position. And uh, I would say that uh, looking at the students that we have in astronomy, I think that uh, this gender balance is improved because uh, the percentage of uh, female in, uh, between the student is increased with respect to the percentage that we have now in the research institute. And, and are you capturing data on this as well in terms of sort of trends and um, long term um, long term statistics? No, because yes, our institute, uh, there is a, a study statistics, uh, just uh, had a look at uh, in these days, uh, and uh, it was a couple of years ago, but every uh, three, four years, uh, they improve, they update these statistics in order to be uh, updated about the number of uh, uh, women that we have uh, in the new position. Because, for instance, in the last uh, six years, we increased the number of researchers because we hired more than 300 researchers in our uh, National Institute. Uh, and uh, several of these younger researchers are women. And maybe the percentage is higher than uh, and, uh, uh, using the uh, older statistics. Can I just finally ask, I mean, um, I, I, I was a physics teacher for many years before becoming a member of parliament. And we had this perception of Italy as being quite good in terms of diversity. It had a different kind of attitude towards um, bringing women on in science. And certainly institutions like CERN had a good representation of female physicists. Is, is this a... Um, is is this just a national phenomenon in Italy, or or is my perception perhaps not no, correct? I, I think that you're right. I think that you're right. I think that uh, uh, looking just uh, when uh, uh, participated to international uh, large project, uh, I can see more women from Italy. This is true, and uh, now we are starting to see some women have it. Uh, some resp important responsibilities, top level position. And uh, yes, I think that is true. For instance, in my uh, uh, group, uh, I have uh, more women than uh, men and uh, working with uh, uh, in the large projects. And uh, this is not, uh, this is uh, uh, used also for other projects, for other large projects, looking at other colleagues. And uh, yes, I think that uh, you're right about that. Thank, thank you. We'll just need to work out what your secret is then. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Can I thank Mr. Cribonese uh, and Professor Thomas for helping us uh, with our inquiry. Um, we go to our final uh, oral hearing uh, of this inquiry before we publish our report uh, next time, which we'll be hearing from the, uh, the Funding Council, the STFC, uh, from the UK Space Agency and the Minister. Uh, so thank you for uh, helping us uh, see the international perspective. And to all our witnesses this morning, uh, thank you very much indeed. That concludes this meeting of the committee. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.